welcome to episode two of uh, Future Library, the podcast that I started a week or so ago. Uh, it's made it to episode two, which is a probably a good step. Uh, today's show, uh, I've got uh, a couple of guests on. We were hoping to get three, but uh, Jesse Cudler, the American musician, hasn't appeared. If he does appear later on, we'll bring him in. But today I'm joined by uh, Gary Marshall up in Scotland and Yuri Landman. Uh, whereabouts are you, Yuri? I'm in Venendal, the Netherlands. Oh, in the Netherlands. So we've yes. got we've got an international European bent today. <laughs> uh, rather than doing the whole kind of uh, Clive Anderson smooth introduction of actually sort of having a whole load of facts that I can rattle off about my guests today, I think it's probably better to let them introduce themselves. So uh, I'll start with Gary. Uh, Gary, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, my name is Gary Marshall. I'm a freelance journalist. I write about technology and I've been covering things like digital music since about 1998, 99. Um, I also um, self-publish on the Kindle and in dim and distant past I used to play in a rock band. Indeed. And I remember that band. It was a band called Casino. It was, yeah. We were fairly early to the whole digital downloads thing and we proved categorically that you can give away hundreds of thousands of downloads and still not make a penny from music. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember you were one of the earliest people I encountered that was kind of rapsing lyrical about giving away music and and things that you said back at the de- in the day kind of stuck with me. The whole idea that you could record something in the morning, upload it in, at lunchtime, and by the end of the day have had more people hear it than would have heard a seven inch played on the John Peel show. Um, yeah. It's a great thing. People aren't picking up on how great it is, but <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, Yuri, tell us a bit about yourself. Yes. Um... My name is Juri Lindman. I'm from the Netherlands, as I said, and I'm an instrument builder as well as a musician. And uh, so I make stuff and I play on it. And you've made some instruments for for some quite high profile artists. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did. I did uh, develop my skills for six years, uh, prototyping my own instruments for for playing. Uh, myself, and then I decided to to uh, how do you say this? To set up a promo campaign, so I, I approached known artists uh, to work on my instruments, and, and uh, yeah, that made me famous in a small niche of experimental guitar players. And um, so I did that for a few years, but I've abandoned that uh, that that road, and I've now, I'm now working. Uh, more autonome and uh, I've developed workshops for festivals so I'm, I'm doing um, workshops on location where I build stuff in four hours only Excellent. and I make, make uh, I've basically I've, I've created IKEA sets for instrument uh, building uh, workshops and uh, so I don't have to assemble the instruments myself the, the, the people can learn how to do it and that, that's, that's my, my main Occupation nowadays. Fantastic, and the, of course, the good thing is one cannot download a guitar. No, <laughs> well, you can, not you can, yet. We it's can, coming. Yeah, well, you can download a kind of guitar uh, yeah. on your iPod or your iPhone, but it's not as good. <laughs> no. I, I know from experience it's not as good. I tried them; they're unplayable. <laughs> uh, and there's something not as good as playing guitar. Anyway, let's cut to the chase. Uh, file sharing. Uh, it's been around, as Gary's already pointed out, for as long as practically the internet has been uh, but it's kind of hopped back into people's minds a little bit recently after uh, Emily White who I believe is an intern at NPR Music uh, wrote a blog post called I Never Owned Any Music to Begin With uh, in which she kind of explained how she'd over the years had only bought 11 CDs and uh, had downloaded a lot of music and when she was working at the radio stations had gone into their libraries and ripped a lot of music to her computers uh, Partly the the article wasn't brilliantly written, but she technically hadn't really done anything wrong. But it seemed to spark the ire of quite a lot of other people. Uh, amongst them, uh, David Lowry, I believe it is, of uh, Cracker and uh, Campervan Beethoven, uh, who wrote an open letter to her uh, on another website, uh, basically laying into her uh, in a kind of, I'm not intending to do this kind of way, but then doing it anyway and practically accusing her of ultimately uh, by being a file downloader of being directly responsible for the deaths of uh, Vic Chestnut and Mark Linkhouse uh, a little extreme I felt that 
<laughs> and and completely untrue if you look at the various things that caused these these poor chaps to feel that they had to take their lives. Uh, but yes, it causes people to get quite animated, and there seems to be two schools of thought. Now, I have a feeling that all three of us today are on one side of this and think pretty much the yeah. same way about it. Uh, <laughs> when I first saw the article that uh, Emily had written, and people were reposting it, and they were going, oh, look at this person, she's a witch, she should be burned in hell, ah, go round her house with pitchforks. I could have thought, oh, all she's done, she's been a little bit rash by saying that she's done this, she, but she's just admitted to doing what everybody does. So I don't quite see what the big deal is about it. Uh, Yuri's reaction was similar uh, when I when he posted about it, and uh, Gary, I have a feeling you have a similar feeling. But so, firstly, then, what are, what are our takes on it? Uh, I'll start with you, Yuri. What do you think about this? Uh, I think it's a it's a conversation that has happened in two thousand already with Nepstar, and there's nothing changed in twelve years. So apparently, people are not fast learning. <laughs> first, and second of all, is when you're um, doing things in life and you're expecting to be successful with it, you have to have a positive vibe. And complaining about uh, stuff is never a good selling point. So even if you disagree on, on people uh, stealing music or whatever you, people tend to call it, I think you should never admit you're like the camper from Beethoven guy is doing. I think he comes over like a whiner. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a very bad technique to, to uh, establish uh, a, uh, a position in, in your life as a, as, as a businessman. Mm-hmm. Well, it's all a little bit Lars from Metallica, the feeling I get from it. It's that little bit of kind of like, he's making the enemy out of the people who are actually the fans. And and pretty much, I mean, his article blaming, a, you know, well, blaming the, the culture that's built up around uh, free music as being responsible for the suicide of other musicians is uh, not great. Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts on this? My my thoughts are quite complicated on this. I, th- I think Lowry, in in many respects, is right, and I think in some respects he's an idiot. Um, there there has become this idea that because the major record labels are a bunch of bastards, which we all know that they are, that it is then acceptable to steal any music that you want or any sort of content on the internet that you want. And I think anybody who uses the the, the justification of you know evil record labels or anything like that is it? It's just because they can get away with it. You know, it's just that free music. You're not going to get caught, so you're going to do it. Um, but I equally think that Lowry's fundamental argument, which is don't do this because if you do, you will burn in hell when you die, <laughs> isn't a real good way of building a business. And you know, to an extent, Lars from Metallica was right because what he saw back in I think it was 1999. Um, was that other people were making money out of his stuff. Mm-hmm. And we saw that recently with Mega Upload, where you had Kim.com, for example. He was pulling in hundreds of thousands of dollars a month by charging people um, to download illegal music. So you know, to an extent, that's a market failure, though, because these people were clearly willing to pay something. Um, they just weren't willing to pay what, for example, HMV was charging. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that I think is quite interesting about this, because I, I am a pirate. I pirated Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. And the reason I pirated Breaking Bad because the gap between it being on broadcast and then turning up in the torrents and being available to buy on DVD is months. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to get done for it. I'm not, you know, nobody's going to come knocking on my door going, come on, you know. So when the new series starts Breaking Bad, what, next week, I'll be on the torrents within hours yeah. because I can get away with it and because I want this. But if somebody said, you know what, there's loads of people outside America want to buy this. We will put this on as it is broadcast on you know, NBC or HBO or whatever station it's on. You'll be able to download this across the internet, provided you pay for it, and it's not going to be too much. They would have my money. And we had this with a comedian, um, Louis C.K., where he did Live at the Beacon, and he says, you know, here, five bucks. Here's my concert thing. Five bucks. Please don't pirate it. And hundreds of thousands of people, he made something like 2.3 million from it. And okay, that's the gross. That's not what he's actually taken away from it. Um, but he, he recognized the fundamental thing that, that Lowry doesn't, which is give people an opportunity to give you their money and provide something that they want to pay for. Absolutely. I think the I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I pirate stuff all the time, and mm. uh, it's the, the biggest amount of data that comes pouring out of the interweb onto my computer is is all TV shows. Uh, music, I do download a lot of music, and I'm not going to deny it. And I'll come back to that if I remember later on. But uh, 
TV shows, definitely. Uh, and Yuri, you made an interesting point on Facebook. You were talking about the way these guys treat piracy and how they you know, approach it, whether they use porn sites and things like that. Do mm-hmm. you want to expand a bit on that? Yeah, I was just thinking like this whole thing about uh, copyright infringement and, and um, people making stuff and you're watching it for free or listening it for free. And all of a sudden I realized that I think it's 25% of the websites is porn sites. Mm-hmm. And so all those all those musicians or labels or whatever, these people, I'm just interested. Don't they watch porn? And Because all my friends watch porn. And um, so I cannot really imagine that people who are angry about uh, um, music downloading never have visited a porn site. Mm-hmm. And... You, you only hear the complaints about the music industry, but the porn industry has the same issues. And uh, why should they be treated different than a guy playing a guitar? Obviously, they have a different profession, but their 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 position when it comes to copyright infringement is identical. And nobody nobody feels sad about Jenna Hayes or whatever uh, these girls are. Uh, I mean, and if anybody recently saw the BBC. Uh it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of an awkward uh, topic to, to start about because it, it's sensitive because you, you cannot ask somebody have you ever watched a porn site <laughs> basically <laughs> it's a very it's good analogy though it's a very good comparison because one of the things that we've seen in porn is the industry has been transformed by downloading um, because what you basically had is the problem of scarcity you know before the internet came along if you wanted to see porn there were only very very few places where you could and you would have to go to sex shops and all the rest of it and you'd be just so delighted that you would get porn of any description that you would be happy with any old crap do you know what I mean mm-hmm. German plumbers and stripy jumpers and all this kind of stuff um, and as it became on the internet what has become um, really really uh, clear is that just having two people shagging is not going to make you money anymore they need to be doing it you know with a goat that's on fire in Belgium because the niches have become that small and the mm-hmm. only people that are making money now are the ones doing niche pornography so you know it's not enough to have straight or gay or BDSM or whatever it's very very narrow and narrow niches and exactly the same thing has happened in music um, that is happening in porn where the kind of the mainstream actors can't get gigs anymore. Nobody wants to pay for them anymore. They don't want to just have these people who were huge in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. They just don't want to pay for their product anymore. So what's happening is a lot of these people are now becoming prostitutes um, because that's where the money in the sex business is. And it's a bit like that with music in terms of, you know, an awful lot of people are not making money out of recorded music anymore because the market doesn't want it. Um, and they're having to look at other things because we're at the point where you could, we could stop all music being made from now on and we would never get round to listening to it all yeah you know we don't have a problem now of scarcity it's, it's quite the reverse of that we have access to all the music that has ever been made mm-hmm. um and that, that has put its value down to nothing <clears throat> that's okay um i've just just a, as a little kind of aside i've just had a message from jesse saying that he's he's not able to join us today so we will continue with just the three of us i think you're absolutely right gary i mean i think uh the, the porn industry thing is, was interesting because and it kind of ties into this this uh, article that David Lowry wrote that when he was com- you know mentioning uh, Vic Chestnut and Mark Linkus uh, on the recent BBC documentary uh, that Louis Theroux well, did. Way, I, I asked David Lowry on the, on the, underneath his article yeah. about the porn issue in very polite words, and he refused to uh, refused to answer. <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't even post it because he had, he had to agree upon every post that's beneath it. Oh, right, so it didn't even get through moderation. No, he right. didn't get through moderation. And I asked it twice and it didn't get to get right. through moderation. So that, that surprises me. And, and uh, I'm not accusing him of anything, but I think it's strange when somebody is uh, putting censorship on comments when I'm asking it politely and to bring in a, a completely different medium or a different industry with comparable issues yeah well i mean it's it's like i was saying that with the with the louis through documentary that was on recently i mean it showed that people in the porn industry he'd gone there probably it was about 13 or 14 years ago maybe even longer and it was when it was really at the height of its success at the kind of at tail end of the 90s mm-hmm. and then it's gone back you know this year and people have either had to move out of it the, the, the whole uh, industries in chaos. Uh, people have genuinely killed themselves because their income has dropped away, and they've, you know, they were previously had this. I don't know even how to describe. It, they had this kind of income that was coming in, and they felt it was secure, and then suddenly it's gone, and it's and it really has badly impacted on them. Uh, 
So, I mean, it, it's... I think your, your comparison, Yuri, was spot on. I think... Uh, and I think there's... There's a certain amount of musicians feeling that they are more important than in some yeah. way than you know porn actors or photographers or everything else. There's a sort of sense of entitlement that certain mm-hmm. musicians seem to have. And go on, Gary, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say it. It's a completely misguided sense of entitlement because the thing about the music business is it's a glamour industry and any glamour industry is built on the same thing, which is a tiny amount of people do very, very, very well and the vast majority get fucked. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the, 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 the recorded music industry, the mainstream music industry, 95% of people in bands never get a sniff of a record deal. Mm-hmm. 95% of the ones that do never get, you know, never get to make a second record. 95% of the ones that get to make a second record don't make a third. 95% of the ones that do don't recoup. So you end up with this tiny number of people of the Bonos and the Elton Johns and all the rest of it. And everybody else accepts getting fucked because they hope that one day, if they put up with this long enough, they will get to that level. And that's why you have all the scams, you know, like pay to play and people, you know, will you pay us and we'll get your music to A&R departments <coughs> and all the rest of it. And you have this whole ecosystem. But nobody is going out there and saying, you know, we need to pass laws to protect the travel agents. We need to pass laws to prevent, you know, protect the print newspaper people um, or any other business that's comp- been completely humped by technology. I mean, bookshops have gone. Um, a- an awful lot of the high street has gone. Mm-hmm. You know, this is just all stuff. This just, just happens. You can't prevent it from happening. And I think the problem with people like David Lowry is, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether he's got a point or not. It's happened. And it's not going to unhappen. And we need to identify, well, how are we going to deal with this? Because this is not going to be limited to music. Any sort of creative endeavor is already easily um, digitized and, and distributed. So, for example, in, in my line of work in writing, it's harder and harder to make any money from it because there's so many people willing to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to charge a premium for an ebook because it's so easy to pirate. Yeah. So, what tends to happen, you know, I've, I've got a novel out at the moment and I have given away 16,000 copies of it and I've sold another 12,000 off the back of that. But I'm only selling them at about 30p profit a book. So, you know, I'm not rich from it, but I brought in enough basically to tax the car and take the wife out for a night. <laughs> you know, this kind of stuff. But, you know, this is going to move on. And even musical instruments, I mean, if you go and have a look at the state of the art on 3D printing at the moment, you'll shit your brain out. It's un- astonishing the potential of this stuff. Where you're going to be able to download the blueprints for basically an electronic lathe and it will take the thing in front of your eyes. And, you know, maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years away from that being mainstream. But, you know, if it can be stored digitally and anything can be stored digitally as a model, mm-hmm. then when you, can, when you can distribute that over the internet and have it go to a printer and print a pizza or a bone or an electric guitar, mm-hmm. then we might as well just pack up and go home. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, we're, we're kind of rapidly approaching the, the, the Ian Banks-esque utopian post-scarcity <laughs> society yes, uh, well, in certain like areas. Yeah. And, but, we're, but we're still thinking with a scarcity model. We're still yeah. thinking that you know, there, there have to be self-appointed gatekeepers uh, allowing access to a select few. Yeah. You know, and whether it's the select few who can afford it or you know, who have got the knowledge to get to this thing. Um, and I suppose that I mean, the, the other side of it is that it will still be the, the select few who can afford things, but in their case, it will be the people who can afford to buy the machines to yeah. then make the other things they need. I mean, um, you can just make a machine in the machine. <laughs> that's it, I was going to say. There's yeah. a thing called the RepRap, the Universal Replicator. And this is into Disney Fantasia stuff, you know, yeah. but people are serious about this. Yeah. But this is one of the things that David Lowry gets wrong, I think, because he, he makes the big mistake of, of conflating the, the free stuff movement with the free internet movement. Mm-hmm. And they're two very, very different things because, the, you know, the, the people he's angry about are the ones that want free stuff. And, you know, you, you can see his point, the neck in his, his product. Um, but the people he's saying that are the problem are the free internet advocates. And this is not about an internet where we are free to just steal stuff. This is about an internet where far away American corporations don't get to decide what we do, mm-hmm. that they don't pass our laws, they don't censor our connections. So we've had this laughable thing, which certainly in Britain, and a fair bit of the rest of Europe, where the pirate bay is being censored by ISPs. It's not making any difference whatsoever. Anybody with the, the, the gall to, you know, or with even the savvy, sorry, to, to go in and type pirate proxy into Google will immediately find another way to get onto the pirate bay. Um, but we've got these ridiculous laws being passed that have got a real chilling effect on what could be the next music business or video business or book business. We don't know what it is because they haven't created it yet. Um, and it's being the say-so of American corporations such as Disney. 
you know, so we've got this ridiculous thing where, you know, Mickey Mouse will never go out of copyright, for example. And we have got laws that are basically being built around what Disney wants rather than necessarily what is good for the wider culture and for the jobs of the future. And I think Lowry has allied himself with the wrong side on that. You know, it's not about protecting the entertainment corporations um, or handing your money and, and your control over to Google and Apple and all the rest of it, because they can be just as bloody bad. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's about a wider debate, and we're not having this when we're having this simplistic good guys versus bad guys. Mm -hmm. You know, pirates bad or pirates good, whatever. You know, that does tend to be the debate, and Larry has definitely fallen into that trap, I think. Mm -hmm. Yuri, you'd said on, on your website that you've managed to still eke out a living doing things, and... Uh, I think, and I may be wrong, and correct me if I am. Uh, I think you'd said it was more that you were leaning more towards playing live and and the uh, the workshops and things as being a, a way of making money rather than record sales. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I was just well, <laughs> you were talking. I was just considering about this this uh, this thing in the whole debate. Uh, every there is a lot of complaint about the all copyright infringement and stealing and stuff. And but what everybody forgets is that. Nowadays, you don't need a fax and, uh, and a telephone to book a show in Italy while you're in the Netherlands. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever tried this in the 90s, but this was uh, impossible. People couldn't speak English in Italy, and you can you can never connect to uh, to cities which are far away than 200 kilometers because you don't have the connection. So you were dependent on on agents and, and bookings and promoters, and it's all very local and um, it, it's. It's like like a medieval age almost to uh, how how that worked. So it was so complicated to set that up as a, as an independent artist. And nowadays, I'm I don't I, I have a booking agent in Berlin, but most of the shows I do myself. And, and so I do my own promotion. I, I'm not dependent on journalists. I can book my shows in Spain and all the way through Europe. Um, because of the internet, so there's a lot of benefit coming from the internet, and there's some uh, a lot of of, of, of uh, cons about uh, the internet, and everybody's focusing on what's bad about internet, but there's also a lot good about internet for musicians yeah, if you so. if you're smart enough. And the festival, um, uh, how do you say, development, the music industry uh, regarding festivals has exploded. Well, in the '90s, there were like four or five big festivals in Holland and nowadays there are 300 so when people say compare the 90s with their incomes to the 2012 I, I think that's that's a distorted point of view because you're forgetting there are 200 festivals in, in, in Holland nowadays and, and in every country so that that, that, that industry has exploded and um, there are huge fees available which were not available um, in the 90s or in the 80s so it's just changing it's, it's, it's evolution like it's like the the you have the cold how do you say this the, the old trains with with the with the with the coal and now you have the electric trains. yeah you have the steam trains and now you have the electric trains and that's so the internet is just the digital revolution and you cannot just look at what's bad and and try to preserve that and um get away with the with the with the good things it offers as well mm -hmm. No, I agree. I mean, I, I remember, it's interesting you're saying about back in the 90s, I remember when I first moved up to Scotland, uh, I was lucky that the internet was actually the thing that enabled me to get to know a lot of people like Gary. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I hadn't had that, I'd have been absolutely scuppered. Before I moved to Scotland, before the internet was really something I had access to, uh, I remember being in a band, I was probably in my early 20s, and we were living in Solihull, just outside Birmingham in the UK. And we knew what was going on in the bands in Solihull and the bands in Birmingham. But Coventry, 15 miles down the road and mm -hmm. a 20-minute drive, we hadn't got a clue. We didn't yes. know what venues there were, what bands were playing there. If you set a gig up there, you could have no guarantee of getting anybody to come along to it. Uh, I remember setting up the only kind of lengthy, well, lengthy, I say, when we were in Scotland, we came down, uh, one of the bands I was in in Scotland came down and did a week playing in England. And just setting up those five dates took like two months of phoning people um, yes. and trying to get hold of people and, and yes. still not knowing really who the people were to speak to in individual towns. Now, uh, for example, I'm going up to Derby on Friday night to play a show uh, purely because of somebody I know through Facebook. 
Yeah. Yes, and I know that the people who are putting me on know what kind of music I'm making because they can go and listen to it on my website and they can download it all for free and they can tell people, yes, if you want to hear what this artist is going to be doing, go and listen to this. Uh, they can go and watch videos because it's now incredibly easy for us to make videos of everything. Yes. Uh, you're, not, you're, not depend, you're not dependent on, on articles and, and music reviews. No, not at all. So no. that's, a, that's a very good benefit for for spreading because you just want to spread information. You don't you don't need an interview. It's nice to do interviews, but you need you just need a, a selling point through the internet. Yeah, that's the only thing you need. You know, and the way I see it is that we're really no different from people who paint or people who do you know theatre work and things like that. Artists are artists, and if you can do it without losing money, then that's as you know that in some cases can be as good as it gets if you're not losing any money then great if you're making some money on top of that even better but as long as you're not losing money that's great and if you are losing money and people aren't coming to your shows and people aren't buying records that you're making then maybe you're not making things that people like you just have to accept that and then you have to decide whether you're doing it because you like doing it or because you feel you want to make a load of cash yes yeah. And this is something that Steve Albini has, has been quite vocal about in the aftermath of the, the Lowry thing, mm -hmm. where he basically says, you know, if the world is not willing to pay money for what you're doing, maybe the world just doesn't care as much about it as you do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would I would argue that there's been a, a huge change in, in not just the, 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 the position of music. It's not as important in the world as it used to be. It doesn't have that central thing in all of our pop culture. We're not all sitting watching the same episode of Top of the Pops on a Thursday night, this kind of stuff. Yeah. But also, people like David Lowry are from the point of view of other people do the work for them. And what you do, you know, you go into the studio, you record your songs, someone else puts them out, markets them for you, you then tour it, and the money comes in. Whereas the model now is more like somebody, for example, like Kina Granis, who's doing the, um, you know, the Sound of Silence. It's in the Wallander advert at the moment. Mm -hmm. for the, um, so this is one of these YouTube celebrities. And I know nothing about her. I'm a grown-up. I have no idea what the kids are into anymore. <laughs> um, but if you look at the amount of work she does on social media and the gigs she does, you know, she'll play in, like, train stations and tell all her fans on YouTube and all the rest of it. And it's all of this, this idea that people are no longer just sitting there going, right, I'll get a record deal and then I'll be rich. They say, no, what I'm going to do, I'm going to spend constantly interacting with my fans, finding like-minded artists, appearing on other people's YouTube videos. I mean, the work rate of these people is astonishing. And one of the reasons that I'm not famous, other than having a face like a bin lid, is because I was never willing to put in the amount of work that was necessary, even in the early kind of internet days, to make it happen. I just wanted someone to give me money so I could do it. And what the internet is basically saying is, well, you know what, that doesn't work anymore. And one of the things I think is really interesting is, see all the people that are moaning about the internet? It's all white guys playing rock music. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You're not getting very many grime artists or R&B producers moaning about it because they accept that well the world has changed so we will make money off the back of the gigs off the merchandise off the you know selling it to adverts um, you know doing bloody songs about Kovasi whatever it happens to be that brings in the money mm -hmm. um, and again very very active in social networking either through street teams or you know individually and that has changed it's a huge change yeah absolutely I mean there's a guy I know uh, somebody I used to work with uh, in a previous job a chap called uh, Taz Reed, who uh, performs under the name Tazel in Birmingham, and he's a grime MC. Uh, he doesn't sell any of his music. Everything he makes, he gives away for free on on various websites. But he can charge between a hundred, two hundred, three hundred pounds per gig and gets it yeah. uh, because the audience is there and the audience are willing to pay to see him perform. And they know the tracks because he's given them away. Yeah. And I think that's the way to look at it. I mean, I know that David Byrne wrote something similar a couple of years ago saying that really records should now be seen as promo for the gigs mm -hmm. um, and for the tour. And it's a little bit easier, I think, in a country the size of the States where you could tour for six months and never return to the same place. Yes. Whereas in the UK, after two weeks, you're back in Southampton playing to ten fewer people than you were paying, playing to the week before. Yeah, I, don't, I don't agree on that. I think the US is, is a... It's a hell to tour. Yeah, yeah, because there's no funding there. Yeah. So the, their whole infrastructure is is uh, is not very good. And uh, basically, my experience is, is that the UK uses a similar system, which is also not so good, and it's indeed a smaller country. But uh, regarding Scandinavia, France, Germany, and Austria, and and the Benelux, they have uh, very well funded um, music mm -hmm. uh, venues. They receive like 300,000 uh, euro each year to uh, set up their uh, program. And this results in a, a very uh, vivid festival 
and music venue um, touring industry. So you can easily get, like you're, you're mentioning, three hundred pounds. That's that's quite common in Holland. Right, I see. I think partly there's, no, there's nobody in the US who's paying for me. I, it's all all door deals or whatever, yeah. and it's impossible for me to tour, tour in in, uh, in the US. I only did it once because there was one festival which had money. Um, well, in Europe, that money is never an issue for for live music. I think part of the thing is I think I get the impression with mainland Europe is that they treat the arts with a bit more respect than certainly the UK does. I think the UK is very sports-centric. Yes, and yes. the money goes to sports. And I mean, we've got the Olympics thing going on at the moment. And one of the first things that got raked to the eyeballs was the arts when they needed money for the Olympics. It's like, oh, the painters don't need money. We'll take it for the Olympics. Did you see, though, that they actually consciously fucked musicians with this? Because um, they were asking people to, to provide their music for various Olympic events and says, no, the intention, no, no, it's the Olympics, you don't get paid. <laughs> Which, when you look at the amount of money that's going into this, not just our money, but you know, from all the various corporate sponsors, and just, no, musicians don't get paid. So, I mean, if this is right at the level of, you know, the Olympic organizing committee and they don't want to pay for music, you know, what chance have you got persuading the average punter with a Facebook account and a smartphone? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a depressing state of affairs in some ways. I mean, I I wrote a little bit about this a while ago that I could have part of me kind of hopes that things get worse because they might then get better afterwards. Mm. Uh, it's maybe a kind of slightly optimistic and an idealistic uh, way of thinking about it. But I I wrote this little kind of thing that I had posted on Facebook and on one of my blogs that I'd like to see the music industry in the UK collapse to the point where rehearsal studios are going out of business and or they, they go the way that all those horrible little demo studios have gone they've all vanished <laughs> uh, because that combined with this new change in the law in the uk with live music which is it's one of the few things that's that's actually made me feel happy about the government at the moment is the change in licensing law in the uk that means that uh, venues under a certain size won't need licenses yeah. uh, for live music which means that practically anywhere that can put a gig on Okay, that's great. That's if people great. Can, you know, if people can get, you know, if they can get a PA into a space or speakers or whatever, then they can put a gig on at the lo- local laundrette on the street, wherever. Uh, and I think that's good. And I think it could be kind of my idealised view of this would be that it weeds out all the people who are doing it to try and make money. It gets rid of all the bands that sound like the Killers and Oasis, <laughs> and ends up with people who are doing it for the love of it and doing it because they feel that it's important. And then that pulls the quality up again. At the, at the gigs that people can see and maybe engages people again with live music I think it's hopelessly idealistic that view but I kind of nurse a little flame of hope for that <laughs> yes. yeah. I think you know I, as long as skinny spotty teenage boys think that having an electric guitar or a turntable or whatever it is is going to get them laid I think we're going to have bad music I think yeah. that's kind of inevitable um, but I mean, it, our mutual friend McGaz had this theory that at any given time there was about a dozen bands called The Shine in Glasgow, yes. all playing basically very, very bad versions of Oasis. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that, that you and I have spoken about quite a lot in the past is pay to play, which has been a life support for that kind of thing. Yeah. And you find that, you know, generally speaking, when that isn't there, there's very, very little live music because people generally don't want to go and see it if it's no good mm-hmm. so maybe you're not that naive but i think what's missing in in britain is the more european model of, of kind of funding things in the arts that wouldn't otherwise get any attention because one of the things that the internet doesn't really have is a shit filter you just have this enormous wall of content now and it's very hard to find anything that's worthwhile and you know some of the bigger sites that pitchfork and stuff do their best but it's still, you know, this is an astonishing amount of really good music that I know I'm missing out on and I have no way to get um, because people aren't going all for the same things. You know, don't, you don't have the same gatekeepers like the NME, Top of the Pops, Radio 1, you know, Radio Clyde, all this kind of stuff playing new music. It's kind of gone out of the window. So it's become much more homogenous, much more of a kind of mainstream R&B is all you hear unless you really go out looking for it. And I think that would be nice if that changed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yuri, the, you were saying about the, the model of, of things in, in mainland Europe. Uh, I remember reading an article a while ago in which the musician Christian Finez uh, commented that he was a state-sponsored artist, which enabled him to continue uh, to make work uh, even when it wasn't particularly profitable or popular. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think the, the state has a role in... 
uh, funding the arts? Definitely. Uh, because um, in, in, in France, it's pretty well arranged. When you, you can get, uh, when you have 50 gigs a year, Approximately, uh, it has to, it has to, they have to be qualified for uh, so you cannot do a pub uh, show, but it has to be on certain spots. But when you do fifty of those, you get um, a, uh, what do you say this? Like a minimal salary or something? Right, like minimum wage. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's not. There were some some similar things in Holland, but not nowadays anymore because you have a right wing movement coming up. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that's that's a wonderful. Um, Set up and and, and um, basically my idea about culture is that culture feeds tourism and um, uh, it's, it's good for restaurants, it's good for hotels. Uh, the, the city becomes more uh, attractive, so the, the prices of the houses go up. All those secondary benefits of uh, which are related to sports as well as as music, because it makes it makes life more comfortable. Um, I think the the primary sources, so whether it is soccer or or, or, a, or a live gig, should be should be funded because it's not spoiling our world. Mm-hmm. And, maybe one and, and, and it's also when you're an artist and you're playing outside Holland, then I, in my own niche, I'm a representative of of my own country. So I think there's there's so much funding going on for for big industries when they when they do export. So why shouldn't an artist doing export not be funded? I think it should be be equal to the situation of somebody who makes cars and sells it to whatever other country. That's a good point, Gary. You suddenly had something to say there. Yeah, I think one of the th- one of the things that gets thrown up whenever you talk about state funding of the arts is you get the straw man argument of you know, well, do we really want the government saying you know what music we can listen to and what music is worthy of support? And I don't think that's the model to go for. I think and there's very little likelihood of this ever happening. But if they were to subsidise the venues mm-hmm. rather than the individual acts, let the venues decide who to put on. Um, but the reason I'm not optimistic is that you, you, for all that we're much more into sport than, than, than the arts in Britain, if you look at what's going on in terms of the selling off of, of public playing fields, mm-hmm. which are generally going to property developers, so we're losing this entire feeder infrastructure for even sports. If we can't even keep that, what chance have we got of having anything that's going to be, you know, for you know, anarcho folk collectives to play their gigs? Um, and I think that that is a shame because it doesn't even need to have a financial value. The whole point of the of art is it's supposed to be a, a good in its own right. It's a public benefit just to have good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, we seem to be going through a, a kind of new philistinism where this kind of stuff, if it doesn't generate a profit, is not worthy. And this is right back to the attitude of the musicians as well, that if somehow music has become about making money rather than about an end in itself. Because we've had hundreds of years where musicians didn't make a penny, doing what yeah. they did, and they were, they were the lowest of the low. Um, and they would just basically play music in a desperate attempt to get something to eat. And it was Mick Jagger of all people who said, you know, basically from about 1970 to 1997, a few people made an enormous amount of money from selling recorded music. Never happened before and is never going to happen again. And I think that's true. And I think we're moving away from, from music having a financial value in its own right. Mm-hmm. The, the big worry is what happens when Bono dies. And not just, not just Bono, but, you know, because we've got this infrastructure at the moment where, you know, the money has moved from music recording to music performance mm-hmm. um, in, in astonishing numbers. Um, you know, I'm sitting here, I've got tickets in front of me for Muse and for Radiohead and Richard Holly and all the rest of it. And they're all pretty large sums of money involved going to these things. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the numbers going through the door, do a, quick, you know, a few quick sums and you can see the, the sheer amounts of money being spent here. But as that's happening, the, kind of the mid-level, I think, is falling behind. And the, the whole system that, that created those acts, I think, is falling away. And the question is, you know, if, if music really matters and we want people to be able to spend full time making music if we do I don't know if we do um, but what sort of infrastructure do we want in place for that would we have subsidised venues would we have you know whatever I don't think legislation is the way to go but that is all that seems to be getting called for at the moment which is you know ban this close down this bit of the internet and it, it's much more complicated than that yeah it's uh... Uh, about regarding the funding issue as I know uh, Canada has changed their uh, strategy about approximately eight years ago and if you take a look at the current state of the um, Canadian pop industry, it's very healthy. There are a lot of 
Canadian bands touring because they get a grant for touring in Europe. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not uh, when you're when you're funding an artist, it doesn't mean he's sitting on the couch and uh, just uh, doing funny things all of his life. He's, he's still working hard because they are touring, and they wouldn't be able to tour in Europe when there was no grant. Yeah. Um, in the initial way, and and that's a, that's a Swedish model because the rock set and all those bands they they had the same structure in Sweden uh, five years before that, mm-hmm. and I think that's a very healthy situation to get your bands outside your own country. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's, it's like an export funding. So I think I think that's very that's very valuable. And uh, regarding the music venues, you, you can fund music venues, which is good, but the danger is in, in especially in Holland we have. Um, venues with a capacity of 500 to 1,000 people in every big city. And those are the cities, they are like, they use it as a vanity tool. So they create a, a, a beautiful space which costs like $3 million or whatever, or euro, sorry. And um, the result is that the bands don't earn any money, but the, the, the building looks good. <laughs> and I think that's not very good for 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 music industry. You should you should just uh, free the um, the squatting laws or, or whatever. Like like open open up old buildings and do your do your shows there, and then that's cheap and uh, it's for the benefit of the pop culture, not for the benefit of the city. Yeah, absolutely. But there's two sides about about art funding. Sometimes it gets into architecture instead of uh, music, and that's kind of weird. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, well, we're coming up on the the end of the the show. Then, uh, I, firstly, that I'd just like to say thank you to to both Gary and Yuri for for coming on. It's been a pleasure having you both on. Uh, before we finish, though, uh, if you want to give us a bit of information about uh, where we would find more information about yourselves, uh, Gary, if people are wanting to find out about you, where should they point their browsers to? If, if they go to bigmouthstrikesagain dot com, that's my kind of base on the internet for all my various things. Um, yeah, um, you can find out about my, my print work as well because I do quite a lot of stuff about the music business and digital music um, and link to quite a lot of it from there. Fantastic. And Yuri, if people are wanting to find out uh, about your, your courses and guitar building and your music, where would they look? Yeah, I have a website, hypercustom.com. Hypercustom, yeah. Yeah, and there's my agenda where my events take place and uh, there are some links with an issue brochure and Bandcamp and SoundCloud and all those connections you have nowadays. But it's all on that website. So you start on hypercustom.com and you'll find your way. Fantastic. Well, there we go. File sharing is an issue that's not going to go away and I'm sure it'll come up again at some point in the future. Uh, As I say, it's been a pleasure having both of you on. uh, And all I have to say is thank you and goodbye. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye.